want to mention before we get started. Next week, services are canceled Wednesday night. Uh, Thursday, I, um, it's going to be canceled too. We just leave the calendar pretty well empty on Easter. I'm hoping to encourage people to make it out for the uh, the uh, Good Friday service. That's always very special. We often have a lot of people from our uh, community join us, so that should be a good thing. So we'll tell you what, let's go ahead and uh, dive into what, what we've got. Actually, you started your dive last week with um, Karen. Actually, we need to do one thing, and that's to repeat Psalm 121. Uh, before we get started, I had that on my list. It's a good thing I wrote a list. I didn't remember anything. Okay. I think what we'll do is we're close to the end. Last night, we were going to just do five verses, and the ladies took off, and they said, let's just do the whole thing. Okay, so I think what we'll do is just read uh, Psalm 121 uh, twice through, if we could do that together. And uh, so let's go ahead and do it. Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Okay, I start to stumble. I know the places where I stumble, so I'm peeking. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's do it one more time. Uh, let's try it again. Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thy from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I have to give a small a testimony. You've heard me say it before, but Psalm 121.8 is my verse. Whenever we travel, um, I when we're coming down the, because um, we we fly quite a bit, whenever we're coming down the jetway and I step from the jetway into the plane, it's Lord, this verse I often quote, <laughs> that you'll preserve us are going out and are coming in. Um, in 1993, I was afraid of traveling internationally and the Lord gave me that verse. And so since 1993, that's my go-to. But recently I've started applying it even when I get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's for sure. So anyway, being married to a pastor, that's probably wise. Oh my. <laughs> yes. and, a, and a wild one at that. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Oh my. I, let's let's just say Will has mellowed. Um there have been situations really? where wow. yeah, you know, I, I could tell you the stories where he was just constantly getting himself in harm's way. Mm -hmm. I mean, people with guns. Um, you know, I think I've shared with you the whole police force um, in Seneca, South Carolina. There was a lady who just, she pulled up in her house. She'd already shot at her son. They asked the son, hey, who can we get to help in this situation? Anyone you know? Pastor Sin. Oh, so, so they contact, well, 
And so he ends up coming to this scene. And there were, uh, you know, police cars all over the place. People had their Kevlar on and uh, hiding behind cars and stuff. And they want him, didn't offer him any bulletproof vest to go up to the house and get the gun off the lady. So that was one that I, I made some phone calls. I said, we really need to be praying right here. <laughs> okay. And so, so he did. That's exactly what happened. Um, he, she let him in the house and um, got the gun. And then there was the young man that he pulls into our driveway and there was buckshot all over the back of his car. His father had shot at him. So off they go to take care of that situation. So, and, and then the night we went uh, to a, a recital and it was a date night and um, Will never showed up. He dropped me off to go park the car because he thought he could get back there quicker and we were always pushing the envelope getting in. And so it was time, they shut the doors and you don't get in at Bob Jones University um, if you're not there on time. So I thought, what do I do? He's not here. So I thought, well, this is our friend. We said we'd be here. So I went in and sat down. So I didn't see him until after we were done. And that night he got in the car with this guy who said he was gonna shoot him. And so it was like, that one we argued about for about four days. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was like, you can't do that. It wasn't that I, you know, went to the concert alone. My problem was him getting in the car. And so that's a big story. You know, I ought to write some of these things down. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm very thankful for Will. Um, the Lord's used him in different ways I never expected. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, tell you what, we've got some wonderful psalms here today to look at, and we're going to camp out on two of them, particularly 88 and 89, but let's look at um, actually the, the last three, 88, 89, and 90, all three of them are very special that I especially like, but um, this first one is talking about the holy city of um God, and thank uh, Karen last week for covering 86, um, a lot about David, as, as it's written. But in 87, it, again, it's a song or psalm for the sons of Korah, the glories of Zion. This psalm can be read or sung publicly, but it expresses that great love that God has for his chosen city, the city of God. Um, just a question right off. Why do you think one of the one of the reasons God chose out of all of the earth, why do you think he chose Israel to and uh, the Jewish people we know Abraham pleased him and um, exercised faith and they, they became his, his chosen people. But why Jerusalem? Why Israel? Do you, can you think about the map? Israel actually connects three continents. And so the way of the kings, the trade routes went through Israel. It took you to Europe. Uh, it connected you to Asia. It connected you to um, Africa. And so it, that was quite a place to choose. A lot happened in that area. Um, but even in Capernaum, where Jesus had his ministry, um, there at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, there was some waterways that took you up to Mount Hermon, but there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of traffic there. It was a place where the word would go out and uh, God knew it. These were specific places, but I said here, uh, write a paragraph concerning the city of God. Did anyone do that? If you did, would you mind sharing your paragraph? Anyone? Uh oh, this is going to be quiet. <laughs> Where are you? Okay. I'm on Psalm 87. Okay. Today's if the question that's right there, it's, it's um, what do you learn? But write a paragraph concerning the city of God. 
Let me read this while you, these seven verses, while you think about this. His foundation is in the holy mountain. Um, okay. <coughs> the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. And now Jacob, what was his, um, what was his name turned to? Israel. 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 He represented, it was in Jacob that we got the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, but here it's saying the Lord loves the gates of Zion, the gates that are in Jerusalem around the city, more than all the dwellings in Israel. And it says, glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. I'll make mention of Rahab and Babylon. Rahab is another word, another name for uh, Egypt. Um, I think we'd understand that better as Egypt. But to them that know me, Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion, it shall be said, this and that man was born in her in the highest, listen to that line, in the highest himself shall establish her. So God himself is going to establish that particular city. The Lord shall count when he writes up the people that this man was born there. So three verses in a row, he's talking about how special it is for someone to be born in that city. As well, the singers as the players, all instruments shall be there. All my springs are in thee. What do you think that phrase means? All my springs are in thee. Well, it's the highest honor to be a native of Jerusalem. Yes, I think that's a wonderful thing, right? And when, what, what's, what do we know about springs? Sometimes, new beginnings. yes, new beginnings, something that's starting a spring sometimes will form a creek. Sometimes it'll form a pond, um, but it, it, it springs up and water starts to flow. Um, and so he's saying, all my springs are in you. Okay, the word is going to go out from Jerusalem. Um, that's a wonderful thing. Tell you what, anyone dare to share? <laughs> okay. Yes, Mary Lynn, go ahead. It is foundation. It's, in, it, it, it's foundation is in the holy place of... Wait a minute, let me read it again. The holy mountain. The Lord loves its gates more than all the dwelling places of Egypt. Glorious things are said about the city. It is the city of God. People born in it will <clears throat> be noted. God will establish it. The Lord will note the people born there. There are singers and players on instruments there. All of the psalmist springs are there. Very good. And the singers and players, what does that tell you about the atmosphere? of Jerusalem, Happy. how it will be joyful. joyful. Joy. Be joyful, rejoicing, a wonderful place when the Lord uh, rules and reigns. Um, anyone else want to dare to share? Nancy, go ahead. Uh, just a little bit. And then these are, of course, not my words. <laughs> but um, Christ is the foundation, the solid rock, and we have that hymn. Yes. And it's not going to sink. It's not going to fall over. It's not going to totter. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's a city that's up on a on a hill, so you can oversee everything. And it's it's a city that is going to remain forever. Yes, very it's very not special. Not going away. And he um, he met his people, conversed with them, received their praises and showed them tokens of his favor. Gotcha. Members of the Church of Christ, not the Church of Christ, but yeah. Christ Church, right. <laughs> will come from all the nations, from all over. Yes, that's right. So Jerusalem's a very special place. Anyone else want to say anything about the city? <clears throat> Anyone have some thoughts? Let's, uh, for a moment, Let's just reminisce. What has happened in Jerusalem? 
what are some of the things that have actually taken place there? Um, let's think going way back. Where did Abraham sacrifice Isaac? When you look at the Temple Mount um, in Jerusalem, where you see, you know, the octagonal um, building with the golden dome sitting on a flat area, uh, pictures of the mount, uh, that actually was Mount Moriah. Abraham had sacrificed his son there to begin with, Isaac. So that happened in that place. It's the place where David ruled. Um, the city of David, uh, there's a spur that goes out um, from the, the hill of Mount Zion. And that was the city of David. He conquered the Jebusites there. It was there he exercised so much faith uh, in the Lord and ruled. And then Solomon built his first temple. Some people think where that uh, dome of the rock is, that's what we call it. Um, the Dome of the Rock underneath. Actually, back in 1993, we were able to go inside, and uh, there's a, a balustrade, of, a barrier that's put a, around that this big rock in the middle. Some people think there's evidence that that may be the very rock where the Holy of Holies uh, was uh, set, set, the foundation stone. Uh, so we know God's very presence um, was displayed on that mountain. Um, when uh, Solomon built the temple, remember what? Uh, the Lord filled the temple with his Shekinah glory cloud. And so wonderful things happened there. People came from all over Israel to worship for the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of the Passover. They still do uh, today, although they don't offer sacrifices but that mount one other question i want to point out there and this is really i think part of the uh the battle that is happening over that city um how many people come or what different religions are tied up on that mount where we see the dome of the rock so what religions are there? Um, we have the, what? The Christian religion. We know the mount because we're thinking it's the temple. It's the temple where Jesus actually came and watched them put the, you know, the widow's might. Um, it's that place. He was crucified very close to that place. Um, the stone quarry that's at the end. He was crucified down in that place. Um, but what other religions? So the Christian religion were, were very tied to that place because of Christ. Muslim. Yes, Islam. Islam. And so um, that, that um, dome that's there is like Mecca to people. Um, if you can't go to Mecca, go to Jerusalem. And see the mosque there, that, that Dome of the Rock was built in about the 6th century um, AD. Um, and so Islam, in fact, it's the Muslims who are in charge of that mount today. So here you have the place where the temple was, and the Jews are not even in charge of it. The Muslims are. So uh, you have to be very, very careful. You can't go into this Dome of the Rock without a head covering, uh, and you meet their standards uh, when you go in. But the last two times we've been to Israel, we didn't even go inside. So I've only gotten there one time. I think I think things have heated up so much between the Palestinians and Israelis that some of the guides just don't even want to bother trying to get everybody in and out of that place. So you've got the Christian, you've got the um, Muslim, Islam, and then who? Yes. You've got the Orthodox Jews. That's right. The Jewish people. This is the place where they had their temple, where they sacrificed the animals. And so this, that one place hits the heart of all three of those religions. To me, that's just kind of amazing, uh, that very place. The, is, the rock is said that Islamic people, Muslim people will tell you 
that Abraham rode his steed. He was either on, he was on some magical journey where he rode his steed off in the night or he landed in the night on that rock. Uh, that's what they'll tell you. Okay. Yes. Who did, who did that? Did I say Abraham? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mohammed. I did the same mistake last night. Did I say, yeah, I did the same thing last night. I said Abraham rode off on his steed. You know, no, no. The story is Mohammed did. Um, and so, and of course, they venerate the place because of Mohammed. Thank you, Karen, for asking that question. Hey, and if you have any other questions, just go ahead. <laughs> okay, that's just great. So anyway, Jerusalem is a wonderful place. Um, Jesus was crucified outside the city, and we know that one day he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. Uh, there are songs written about Jerusalem. People go up to Jerusalem, uh, pilgrims uh, like ourselves. Uh, we want to go visit Jerusalem and see the sites and the, the things that are there because it's so closely associated with our Savior. Um, but then we know that the plans that God has for Jerusalem, in fact, if you were to read through the book Revelation, you'll see that um, somehow the terrain will change and it's easy to see on um, the Mount of Olives. Uh, people can't get insurance for their whatever they build there because there's a fault that lies. You can see it in the ground. Uh, there's a, a rift in the, in the earth. And so they're afraid there will be an earthquake or something that will be destroyed. Well, yes. So that it tells us that the highest point in that area will be Jerusalem. The uh, earth plates, whatever will happen, Jerusalem will be lifted up. So it's a very special place. Um, and there's a verse, and I should have written down the reference, but it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And so we need to do that. It's going to be a city that we'll be very familiar with one day. Um, any other thoughts on that? I have my little wisdom statement. We should love Jerusalem as it is the city of God that God has chosen from which to rule and reign during the millennium. So we'll be very familiar with it. Any other thoughts on Jerusalem? Do you remember that song back in the, I guess, 70s, 80s, you heard? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. <laughs> and usually somebody with a very deep voice would come up and sing that song. Isn't that in the Messiah? Um, mm, I can't remember. I don't know for sure. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. All right. That verse is Psalm 122.6. Oh, okay. The Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yes. 122.6. Peace of Jerusalem. I'm going to write that. Say that again. Psalm 122.6. Okay. Okay. So anyway, Jerusalem. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and I'll just tell you one site that um, makes makes uh, the place really special. Uh, back in 1993, I'm, I'm going to send you a picture, some pictures here, and you can pass them around. But in Jerusalem, there are wonderful places to see. And Psalm 88 is a psalm that our Arab Christian guide gave us. We were on a 17-day study tour, and he taught us so many wonderful things. Actually, you'll see a picture of him. He's the guy in the um, in the blue here in the middle of this picture. Um, but the site that I want to show you is probably, they say, one of the most very authentic places in the Holy Land. And I'll pass this around, but this will maybe give you an idea of what I'm pointing at so you can look at it. Um, it's a set of stairs. And so when Jesus was um, about to enter the court, he had to go to Caiaphas's palace. And uh, so you come up the stairs and it leads you to this huge building that's there right now. Um, the building uh, is where the Sanhedrin met. And 
they say it is the most authentic place in the Holy Land. In other words, um, this is it. This isn't something anyone anyone has tried to concoct or uh, come up with in their imagination. So he came up the stairs and then he went into the building and there he went uh, and was put on trial. So the edifice that's there today, and I looked real quickly to see if I could get a picture of that. I have it, but digitally, I didn't have a picture of it like this that I could pass around. Um, but anyway, uh, that still is a, a place where the Sanhedrin meet. However, it's built upon the ruins of the old palace. And so when they do excavating and they go down, they find some amazing things. And so um, the thing that you're looking at here is the stairs. Jesus would have walked up. Of course, the stairs would have been a better condition for sure. But when you step through the door of that place, you will find actually today, I'm, this is amazing. This would have been part of the outer courtyard of that original building. So here's the fire. This would have been the outside fire of that place. Today, the last two times we've been there, 2013, and um, I'm thinking whether we went there 19 or not, but they have changed this whole area into a chapel. So, and they've changed the interpretation of the story. <clears throat> So now when you come into this area, you don't, you see where they, they put like a frame around the fireplace, but you don't really know what you're looking at because uh, they've covered the floor, they put walls around. So it's a regular chapel that they've placed right there. And I'm thinking, why did you do that? In 1993, our air Christian guide said that they had collected money that they were gonna make some changes and I thought, oh, don't do this. Because when you come through the door and you see where Jesus had to walk, there's a section in scripture where it says how uh, Jesus met the eyes of Peter. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this just fits that so perfectly. Because in order to go to the place where he was kept, you had to pass through here, go down some stairs, and, and an old cistern is where he was uh, dropped into. And so that's an amazing thing. And so these pictures, this was the, it doesn't, it looks rather insignificant, but this is the, um, the ceiling of that cistern. And so at the time of Christ, he would have been dropped through that hole down into the cistern. And you'll see as we read um, our psalm today, how uh, Psalm 88 fits this so well, and it was our Arab Christian guide in this that uh, pointed us out, pointed that psalm out to us. I'm so, glad you said that, because mm -hmm. when we walked through that building, mm -hmm. the, the main floor, it was so elaborate, and that's and right, colorful, and all this, and I thought, oh, I was so disappointed, because I, and, so and, you said that. and our guide, who was very Jewish, said there couldn't possibly have been a prison in the, in the high priest's home. However, in 90, that was 2019, in 90, or excuse me, 2013, in uh, 93, when we were first there, uh, they took us to the dungeon. They showed us, and that's one of the pictures that's here. Uh, you'll see these bars. And you'll see there's a stone wall there, but there's also places in the wall behind where they tethered people. And I don't have a picture of it, but there was actually a whipping post that was there and two small uh, holes that held oil and held salt. So when they whipped someone, they would rub the oil and the salt in the backs mm. of whoever they whipped. Mm. And there were also places in the walls where Roman soldiers, were uh, helping to guard the prisoners, they could sleep. And so they took us to the dungeon. So, but our Jewish, a very Jewish guide said, oh, he's still protecting the high priest. <laughs> okay, <laughs> after all these years. 
but we're actually in the cistern in this picture. And, um, and I think I have two pictures, no, just one of us uh, being actually in the cistern. So the cistern is the dungeon? Yes, that's, mm -hmm. that is the place where most people would agree Jesus was actually kept the night before he was crucified. Yes, Kathy? How deep is that cistern? Um, I don't know exactly. I mean, would they just drop him down or were there stairs or a No, rope at the time of Christ, they would have dropped him down by a rope. Um, or I don't know if they tethered the rope or how they did it. But there was also, actually, I'll... I brought my iPad, and so I've got just a couple other pictures um, for the ease of people getting in and out of the cistern. They put in a staircase uh, so we can go down into there. But the point is this. When you go to Jerusalem, you will find the authentic, the real places. Some, some things, um, you know, when you're on the Sea of Galilee, um, you know, you can point and say, well, Jesus walked across the water right here. <laughs> Okay, some things you just don't quite get, okay? It's not for real. But there are those places that are authentic and true, and I think that this is one of those places um, that, that you have. So I'm going to just pass it around and take your time because we've got uh, uh, for a little while here. But let's go ahead to this psalm and, uh, and see what we have. Let's just go ahead and I'll read. It says, O Lord God of my salvation, Psalm 88, I have cried day and night before thee. And we know Jesus continually prayed before God. He says, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear unto my cry. This is where we start to get the idea that things... Um, God's plan is being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. For my soul is full of troubles. So when someone says my soul, it's not like you've got a headache or a stomach ache or something. Your, your very being, the inside part of you, that soul, that part of you that will live forever is troubled. Um, you're disturbed. The peace is disturbed. It says, and my life draws near unto the grave. So soon will be his death. And then we have, I'm counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Free among the dead. And I think I've got a note on that. Free among the dead would also be correct to say, set loose among the dead. Um, but the idea is that he would be forgotten and cut off from the hand of God. So free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, who you remember no more, and they are cut off from your hand. So what have we got there? Um, we see that um, he cried out and he's describing himself. His situation is not good. Any thoughts or comments on those first five verses? Anyone? Well, he's very despondent. Not um, thinking that God is remembering him. Okay. Yeah, because he says, whom you remember no more. Okay. He, you know, here I am. I am part of this. I'm like a person in the pit. Here's the perfect son of God, the lamb of God. Um, he's being prepared for the sacrifice he'll make. So question number two is, what actions did God take against the psalmist? And as the psalmist writes, notice that he's not saying the Romans put me here or the Sanhedrin or, um, you know, Pharisees, Sadducees, or these people that hated me. Who is he laying? Who is he saying? God. God. Six, you have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. And I have to say this too. When we went to this dungeon, I'll always remember, you're going, you came across where that chapel is, and you come across and there's some stairs that just start taking you 
down until you reach the cistern. So it would have been very, very dark. There were no windows. It was just the hole in the ceiling and the floor and all around you. Um, so you have laid me in the lowest pit in darkness, in the deeps. Your wrath lies hard upon me and you have afflicted me with all your waves. So there's been um, one affliction that follows another. Okay, and we know that with Jesus, that's exactly what happened. Uh, he's taken there and then he's taken to another place. Um, he's scourged, he's whipped, he's eventually crucified, but all your waves. And again, he's attributing this to God and no one else. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. You've made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. You know, sometimes we wonder if Jesus understands our infirmities, infirmities or if we understand um, his, our pain when we're going through pain. The book of Hebrews, I believe it is, chapter 11, um, no, chapter 4, and toward the end of that chapter, we see that we have a, a high priest. Actually, let me look that up. Hebrews 4 is where I'm headed. Um, we have a high priest who... Uh, let me go chapter four. Here we go. Seeing that we have a, a great high priest that is passed down to the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our per profession. Let's get this. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's amazing. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus knows what it's like. What things is he experiencing here? Um, rejection? Trapped. Pardon me? Trapped. He felt trapped. Trapped, truly trapped. I mean, like, put me in a in a cage. Okay, what else? How else? What about his relationship to God here? He's yeah, recognizing. He Pardon me. Was cut off. Was cut off. Got. He was realizing that he was being cut off from mm -hmm. that eternal relationship he's had with the Father. Pain. Pain? He felt pain. Yes. Probably physical and emotional. Mm -hmm. Spiritual. Every kind of pain. Right. And uh, here he is, a, a per perfect individual, but he is, um, what is it? I'm counted with them that go down to the pit. They're lawbreakers, you know, usually you think of that when they're down there. Um, maybe they were badly mistreated as well. But anyway, let's go ahead. In verses 9 through 12, we read questions that are born out of the psalmist's affliction. So what questions does he wonder about? What do you think Jesus thought about while he was in prison that night? Um, so let's go ahead and read these. He says, mine eye mourns by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I've stretched out my hands unto you. But here we go. <coughs> through 10 uh, through 14. Let's go ahead and ask these questions because sometimes things go wrong in our life and things don't turn out the way that we would desire or the way we expected. Well, he goes this, asks these questions. Will you show wonders to the dead? That's quite a question, isn't it? But did God show wonders to the dead in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. You know, he was resurrected. I like this next one. Shall the dead arise and praise you? Here you're in this lowest pit, probably damp, 
and and no light. And he's asking the question, shall the dead rise and praise you? Um, did, did that happen? Mm -hmm. Yes. So shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave? Are you sure this is a good plan? You know, <laughs> I'll be in a grave. Uh, you know, loving kindness. Will we see loving kindness in the grave? Well, what was the answer? Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's right. He rose from the dead. Or, and I like this one, because this is maybe where we live sometimes. <coughs> is there faithfulness in destruction? Is there faithfulness in destruction? I can't help but think about my friends uh, who lived in Homestead, Florida. Maybe you remember um, years ago, Hurricane, was it Hugo? Might have been Hugo. One of those hurricanes that came through. Uh, Homestead was the town that was completely flattened. Um, and, you know, you, if you just lost everything all at once, would there be faithfulness? Was God faithful? What? How do you deal with that? What would you say? Or your health hits like my brother Les. Faithfulness and destruction, this doesn't look good. Um, yes, God can bring, Isaiah 61 says, he can bring beauty out of ashes. And that's a marvelous, marvelous thing uh, that God can do. He is faithful even when we face destruction. And in Jesus's case, he was crucified, he was killed. Um, but again, God had a bigger picture, didn't he? He had the resurrection of Christ that was there. Um, the people who lost their homes, yes, it's a difficult time, but they did build <laughs> back. Um, they did find newness, a difficult time, but God was faithful in helping them put life back together. Um, so that's one, when we face difficult things, what's one of the main things that can happen when a Christian faces something really hard? What, what's one of the greatest testimonies in this idea? Does anyone want to say? So often we're tempted to, to think, oh, pity me, that God doesn't really care Right. And turn our backs on him then. And yes. we can't do that. Right. And how does Satan use these things against us? How would you say? If he was a good God, how could he let this happen? That's it's not right. that God isn't good, it's that man is evil. The nature has fallen. <laughs> That's right. Causing doubt. What? Causes causes doubt. Causes doubt. Satan can really use these things um, in people's lives when they aren't thinking of the big picture. Model. Well, this is kind of a parallel to what Job went through yeah. in a different way. That's right. He handled it different. He asked why, 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 why. He asked right? it 16 times. And then in chapter 38, God said, now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Yes. Okay. Were you <laughs> there? <laughs> okay. And I love, I think it's uh -huh. uh, Chuck Swindoll said that, that Job missed it, missed it by one, one letter. Instead of W-H-Y, it should be W-H-O. And, and I've always remembered that, that when trials come, that Y will be there, but we need to transfer it to who, who. Yeah. And, and reaffirm our faith in Christ. Yes, that's right. Sometimes when your faith is strong in the middle of a trial, you know, the lights, and you've heard it said, shine the brightest in the darkness. And so when my, you go through something and you don't lose your faith, yes. Ben ben yeah, ben my parents went through World War II, Ooh. and they had to escape. Mm -hmm. with two little boys my mother was pregnant with me uh -huh. and they gave testimonies to I don't know how many churches but their biggest testimony was no matter where they had to hide or what they were able to find to eat mm -hmm. they always thank God for every little thing along the way as mm -hmm. long as they that's right they weren't catching so 
Right. I mean, you know, we go through a heck of a lot. I mean, we all have with our families, mm-hmm. with uh, what's going on in the world. Right. And I just totally believe that no matter what, God's hand is with us. No That's matter right. What. Yes, he watches over us. Um, so, but you get the idea of what I'm trying to emphasize here, Sally. I've learned that when some disaster or hurtful thing comes to me, it's not a sin to be surprised by it. Right. The, the sin is in meditating on what went wrong. Immediately, as soon as possible, sometimes it's not immediate, but as soon as possible, turn it over to the Lord and say, it's yours. You right. brought it, it's yours. And that I often pray, Lord, help us navigate through this. Mm-hmm. Help us navigate <laughs> you know, the waters. Marlo? Well, in Deuteronomy, it tells us that we have a responsibility to share this information with the next generation of yes. God's faithfulness. And I was reading through that passage just this week, and and I question myself, have I told my, I've told my kids, but have I shared with the grandkids all that God has done in our lives? Right. And I think, it, I think we forget that that's our responsibility to yes. help them know God is good that's right. and he'll take care of you. Yes. So I challenge each of you to, you know, from the, right. share it with your kids and grandkids. That's right. Tell you what, Darlene, your hand is up. Well, I haven't shared this with anyone, mm-hmm. but uh, this is very dear to me. Uh, when, uh, verse 10, um, when I had my last son, um, there was a lot of difficulty. They gave me the spinal T soon. He's 60 year old right now. And um, um, uh, so it stopped the birth because of that. So they had to push and push to get him out. And when they did, I was bleeding to death. And of course, I was talking to the Lord the whole time. And um, they kept saying her blood, she has this amount of blood. Pretty soon they said she has no blood pressure. And at that, I, I passed out. I didn't know anymore. But I was talking to the Lord during all of this because I had three of the children. And it was, um, they actually pronounced me dead. And they went and told my husband I had died. And so he left the hospital. Oh my. But they started blood transfusions. So I had seven blood transfusions. And God saved me. Yes. And um, of course, I was in the hospital 12 days. But then I had, they, in those days, they put boards on your arm. And then gave you the transfusions. Mm-hmm. And boy, that was difficult. Mm-hmm. So this is very close to me because mm-hmm. they actually pronounced me dead. Well, no blood pressure. And God saved me. Gotcha. He sure did. Mm-hmm. And we're glad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That is special. <clears throat> but tell you what, let, let's go ahead. Or, uh, Lonnie, you had one thing to say. Well, uh, when you were talking about teaching your children when they're young, I worry about um, in this day and age when they interview kids on the street, you know, when you're on the news and they don't know one thing about the Bible, not anything. I mean, nothing, not even the little kid knowing the ark and, and, you know, things that you learned in, in Sunday school when you were little. I mean, absolutely nothing. But I feel like we're nearing the age where, you know, you're going to start, uh, they're going to try and make you take the mark. And these kids are going to think, well, I don't know anything about God, but if it'll give me, you know, if I can buy food and do sure. this year, I'll just take the mark. You know, I mean, I don't believe in it, but I, it's not important. I, so I can see a lot yeah. of young people just taking the, the mark of the beast just because. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, right. Oh. Because it's just not important. I mean, oh well, I, I'm going to have to have it to buy, right. you know, and in ignorance of the Bible. Yeah, I can just yeah imagine so sure. many young people because of just not knowing anything about the Bible. You know, they're just going to take the easiest route, and 
Yep, that's right. You can't and hire if the yourself. The government tells me to do it. Well, I must have to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, tell you what. Let's go ahead before we. We're only going to get through one more, I think. Um, well, since I've had five, they'll talk to me. <laughs> okay. Tell you what, let's look at verse 11. You've got another question. Shall thy loving kindness be declared? Whoops. Verse 12. Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Uh, people are going to forget what we've done here. You know, are they going to remember? Of course. Here we are 2,000 years later. Um thinking very carefully about all these things that happened to Jesus. But unto you have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer proceed, prevent or proceed thee. Lord, why cast off? Why are you casting off my soul? Why hidest thou face from me? We think about how he was on the cross and how God, you know, the land turned dark. God turned his back on God or on Jesus, the son. God the Father on um, Jesus the Son. But here you see if, if this is correct in this uh, Psalm 88, um, and this is all prophetic, then it started the night before when he was put in that deep pit. He, and 15 gives us a cue. I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer your tears, I am distracted. Um, what my translation says, I'm helpless. Helpless. I I would think that's a better one. Although Jesus on the cross could have called ten thousand angels, we know, but we've got that idea here. You're put in a deep dark pit. Your fierce wrath goes over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend, have you put far from me and my acquaintance into darkness? So as we read this, I just wanted to point that out. This is a very special, I think, psalm uh, that indicates what Jesus went through. But in Psalm 89, I think we get the answer. If he knew 88, which we know he knows all the Bible, but in Psalm 89, verse 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. So to all the questions that are there, uh, Psalm 89.1 kind of gives it to us. I'm going to just, uh, be for time's sake, just give you a, a quick synopsis of 89. And I think I gave you that quote by Gabaline. That's on your notes. Is it at the end yeah. of 88? I'll let you read that on your own. But, and we will uh, not go through the whole Davidic covenant. That's foundational to 2 Samuel 7. It's found in 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 17. Uh, does anyone want to say what was that covenant that God made with David? That he would always have a son on the throne. Mm -hmm. Okay, that his, his seed would be on the throne. What else did you find out? His line would live forever. Okay, that his line would go on forever. Okay, so he'd have the throne. Um, uh, but let's skip down to question number six. Consider verses 34 to 37 and 89. Um, what are some de determinations that God made to David? Um, 34 to 37. He says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. So God's what? Not going to break it. He's not going to alter it. He's not going to lie to David. Uh, he's What he said is true. His seed will endure forever. And it will be established. And so we have this. But the problem is in verses 38 through 45. The psalmist is very troubled. So what's his question? 
um, that he asks concerning uh, this situation. He thinks that, um, let me get it here, but you have cast off and abhorred, you have been angry with your anointed. You've made void the covenant of your servant. Uh, you have profaned his crown by casting it to ground. You've broken down all his hedges. You've brought in strongholds. All that pass by the way uh, spoil him. He's a reproach to his neighbors. You've set up the right hand of his adversaries. Uh, 43, you have also turned the edge of his sword, have not made him to stand in the battle. You've made his glory to cease and cast his throne to the ground. So what's the problem that the psalmist is wrestling with? You've got the Davidic covenant that God promised these things, but did it look like at the time of this writing that God had kept his promise? God He's questioning look on sin. sin. Pardon me? God yeah. cannot look on sin. Right? And, and, but what did he promise? If you go back and read that uh, section in Samuel, it says... That if your seed, if they fall away, then I'm going to visit them. I'm going to remember uh, what they've, they've done, and I'll deal with sin. And so that's uh, pretty much what he's saying uh, here, or has done. Uh, these people have turned their backs on God. They haven't, kept, uh, they haven't kept their faith in him and lived for him the way they should. And so they suffered the consequences. And it wasn't just the people, it was the kings. Yes, the leaders. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's a, especially in our day and age, uh, when your king or leader uh, doesn't do so good. So what's the question in 49? Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses, which you swore unto David in your truth? So he's saying, okay, you promised these things to David. So where is it, Lord? Uh, remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants. How do I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people? And he talks about his enemies. And then uh, we have blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. I just wondered how long God would continue his wrath against him. We would forgive him. Yes, that's right. And here's the thought. We know that Jesus Christ came through the line of David, and God is too just to look away uh, when David's descendants sinned and turned, but he will always keep his promises. And we find that, in, again, in Jesus Christ, all those answers can be found. So, the, you know, as we looked at 88, and you have all those questions, how can there be faithfulness and destruction? Here, it's like, it sure doesn't look like God kept his promise, but he kept his promise in a big way. Um, so uh, that's really uh, something very precious. But the question for us is, what about the promises that he gives to us? Uh, sometimes we can feel low, we can feel down, we can feel like the world's kind of turning against us. But does that negate the promises that God has given to us? that he, we have his indwelling spirit, that we have the gift of eternal life, uh, that we can uh, be with him forever in heaven. Those promises, though things can look rough here, um, he will keep his promises just as he kept his promise to David. Uh, he won't break it. He won't alter it. He won't lie. Um, you know, this is our God. And so we can count on him, depend on him. Uh, any thoughts on that? Any thoughts? Anyone? And I know we zoom through this, but that's essentially the point. Well, I think today so many churches are preaching God's love, but they don't tell the people about his his that his just ways. He he demands obedience and those things, and I think so many people are being led astray. Yeah. By this and. Well, when you have a God who is not just, what does that make your God appear? How does it make him appear? To be what? Weak. To be very weak. Mm -hmm. That he can't, he can't dish out justice. Um, you know, people don't like to talk about God who chastens his children because he loves them. Um, and so you're right. That's a tough thing, isn't it? Um, 
Marla, I, I think we don't know the character of God. If people know God. And yes. It's a three-letter word. Yeah. They don't know his characteristics. And yes. It's a it's great value to take the time to learn all of the dynamic parts of it. It's yes. amazing. Okay. So to know the character of God, how does knowing the character of God help you pray? How, how does that help you? When you understand who you're praying to, it gives you hope. Gives you hope because he's a powerful God. So it gives you confidence in what way? That he is listening. He's listening, hearing. He's on your side. Yes. <laughs> okay, Debbie. Makes you humble. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you know his characters. Mm -hmm. Your yeah. own characters. That's right. Humbles you. He's holy. And we are not. So when we approach him, we can boldly approach his throne through Jesus Christ. What we read in Hebrews uh, tells us that. But we're not going to try to come before God with our arrogance and in our own wisdom. Yes, someone else over here. I thought I saw him. I think we just, yes. we need to remember to pray in his will, not my will. I mean, right. I have a tendency to want my will a lot. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know I, how I that could be. Okay, that's right. So we want to follow him. Uh, real quick, we're going to take just uh, probably three or four minutes here to look at uh, Psalm 90. And uh, because this is the oldest psalm uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, it's written by Moses. So that takes us back to uh, 1400s BC, and we know when we look at Davidic Psalms or thereafter, a thousand BC and closer to the time of Christ with some of these Psalms. But so this is the very oldest. And Moses, again, he was what attributed to, um, he, he wrote uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible. But I find it interesting. This is the only Psalm that's written by Moses. And the thing that is highlighted in this psalm is the idea of time. Mm -hmm. And so as you went through this, I, I the first question here, I said, scan the, through this psalm and notice the references to time. So I'll just put it out. And maybe if you want to just put a dot or something beside the verses. Uh, verse one, all generations. Verse two, before the mountains were brought forth, you are God. Verse three, a thousand years are but as yesterday, a watch in the night. The way God perceives time is so different from what we do. Verses five and six talks about the brevity of life. In the morning, you flourish. You're young and youthful. And then it says, I don't, this is the only one I don't really like. In the evening, you're mowed down. <laughs> when you wither. Yes, when you wither and you're mowed down, Okay, and then verse 9, our days passed away as a tale that is told. Uh, verse 10, days of our years, 70 by reason of strength, 80, labor and sorrow, and then we fly away. So this idea of life, that it is brief. So I, I think what we'll, we'll get to the point of it in a moment. Verse 14, rejoice all our days. Verse 15, days afflicted us, years we have seen evil. But verse 16, I think, is where we uh, start to see the answers. Let your work appear unto your servants, your work, God's work, and your glory unto their children. So whatever we do in life, uh, let's see what God does in our hearts and um, the glory, his glory. We want our children to see and let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. And so I think that's what he's trying to get across is here's our life. So what what work are we doing and, and, and how's God God's hand upon us? We want our children to see this. Um, yay, the work of our hands, please establish it. And so the whole thing here is dealing with time and brevity of life, the work that we do. 
I like this uh, quote by C. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, we are not cedars or oaks, only poor grass. Here's the history of grass, sown, grown, mown, and gone. <laughs> and the history of man is not much more. So, and one other thing in verse eight, does God miss anything? No, he sees everything. And he desires for his people what we talk about. <laughs> so little wisdom, Moses desired that God would help them to use their time wisely. The work that we do can bring glory to God and touches the next generation. So I think we'll leave it at that. I think I have one picture I'll dig out here. I think I must have taken it out. Okay, let's go ahead and close in prayer.